The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Hi. Well, thank you. Well, as he said, I am the founder of the PCBSD project, and uh, today I'm just going to be giving kind of a brief overview of PCBSD 9, what it is, how it differs from Linux, uh, maybe what's different from previous PCBSD versions, and just give you enough of an overview so you can ask questions. And that's really what I enjoy is the question spot, because there's usually really good stuff that comes up, and I'll be happy to answer. If I'm going too fast, or if you guys see something and have a question about it, just raise your hand, get my attention. I love uh, following rabbit trails, and we will go ahead and dive into it. But uh, let's go ahead and get started. So the first question I always get when I come to a Linux conference is, what is PCBSD? And more accurately, sometimes what they're asking really is, what is BSD? So I like to start with what it's not, because this is the first couple things I hear. Well, first of all, it's not a fork of Linux. It's not a flavor of Linux, and it's not a distribution of Linux. Those are the three things I hear a lot of times. What it is, is a branch of Unix, which derived from the original AT&T Unix in the late 70s. One thing that makes it different from Linux is that it's a complete operating system in the sense that it has a kernel and an integrated user land. It's not just a kernel with some packages thrown into it. You can grab FreeBSD, install it, and have a workable environment with SSH. Uh, compilers, other tools as a part of the base operating system. It's released under a business-friendly BSD-style license, which is where I make my first little digression and we chase a rabbit trail. What is the BSD license and why is it so business-friendly? What's the difference? Well, this is it. If you can read it all here, this is the entire free BSD, BSD license. It's actually two clauses. I think it started at four did it start at five? Four? And then it went down to three, and now we're down at two. So it's gotten smaller as time has gone on. And basically the gist of it is, here's our software. Don't sue us if it doesn't work. And if you use it, include the copyright somewhere. I mean, it's really easy to read and comply with. Whereas the license that Linux uh, programs, a lot of them use the GPL, has tended to get bigger over time. And as you can see here, it has gotten larger and larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. And you know, for various reasons, you may be on one side of the fence or the other, but at the end of the day, that means we have more lawyers involved, we have to decide what we can do and can't do with this license, what's allowed, what's not, and some may argue it's for extra freedom, which fine, you know, people could take different sides of this issue, but on the BSD side, it's simple, it's free in the sense of we give it to you, do whatever you want with it, we place no restrictions upon you. And that's always been the spirit of the BSD community. So back to our regularly scheduled program. So what is FreeBSD? As I said, it's a descendant of the original BSD Unix. It's a complete operating system, which can then run third-party applications via the ports and packages system. That would be your equivalent of uh, RPMs, et cetera, on Linux. It's popular server OS for hosting companies, data centers, et cetera. That's where you'll see it running in the background, just happily churning away, doing its thing. It's able to build and run pretty much all the open source applications you're familiar with out there, such as Apache, Xor, KDE, Firefox, LibreOffice, OpenOffice. I think there's 26,000 ports at last count, give or take a few. And those are, the bulk of those are just the traditional things you're gonna see on any Linux distribution. It includes some other unique features. Uh, one of them right now is ZFS, is kind of the hot one that everyone's talking about. But we have things like Jelly for disk encryption, Geom, G-mirroring. I mean, there's a lot of unique FreeBSD features. But uh, ZFS is the biggie at the moment. Something a lot of people don't know is we include a compatibility layer, which is kind of neat. It allow you, allows you to run Linux applications natively on BSD without emulation. It's not actually emulating things. It's just mapping Linux calls into FreeBSD calls and doing its thing. So occasionally you'll see a benchmark article written and they'll be like, hey, we ran some Linux app or game on BSD and found out it ran faster on FreeBSD than it did on Linux because we're more efficient in whatever area for multiprocessing or whatever it is. But that's an interesting side you know, tidbit there. If you do have something Linux, you can still run it on BSD often. That's how we run things like Skype, for example, which they only release a Linux version of. So now that you've got a little background on FreeBSD, 
What is PCBSD? Well, it's a desktop version of FreeBSD, but it's not a fork. We haven't taken it and changed it too much. It's 100% FreeBSD under the hood, and we intend to keep it that way for as long as we can. Um, it comes pre-built with desktop packages, such as X, KDE, and maybe GNOME, XFCE, et cetera. So all your little desktop goodies are there, right out of box. And we try and initialize it for the best desktop environment possible, which means we include things like flash support and NVIDIA binary drivers right out of box. Um, we don't really have a dog in the fight over licensing issues. We just want the desktop to work out of box. And I know a lot of users, when they get a system that doesn't have those, that's the first thing they fetch. So we're just gonna try and make it as easy as possible. Uh, yeah, MP3 support's in there as well, so yes. Uh, so what else do we add on to FreeBSD? Well, the first thing you're gonna see is, if you've ever installed FreeBSD, you know it's got a text-based installer and there's no X stuff. Well, one of the first things we added was our own custom GUI for installation because, again, we're targeting a desktop audience. We want this to be easy to use. And we support a lot of cool FreeBSD features that maybe you can't even do in the FreeBSD installer right now. This would be like ZFS. If you wanna do a ZFS installation where there's no UFS and it's just one big Z pool, you can do that. You wanna turn on Jelly for disk encryption? That's a popular option if you're on a laptop. I can just click a button, type in a password, and now my disk is encrypted. It won't boot up until I supply the password. Um, we can do mirroring, we do automatic labeling of drives, and that's really cool. Like say you have a desktop with multiple SATA drives and you unplug certain things, plug it in, your FS tab doesn't go away or go, go nuts because device names have changed. Um, we also allow installing FreeBSD or PCBSD off the same disk. That DVD has enough room that we could put both on there happily, so if you want to install a FreeBSD server with maybe some of these disk options, like ZFS, something that might have been more difficult to do with the FreeBSD installer, we allow you the opportunity to do that via our installation disk. And of course, we have all the typical uh, installation choices, you know, DVD, USB, network. We have some live disks, which uh, have KDE on them right now, and you can install from that. Um, for 9.1, we're talking about putting other window managers on there as well, so you have more to play with. But uh, right now for 9.0, this is what the installer looks like. It's written in Qt, and it's just a pretty simple uh, wizard-based uh, graphical installation environment. You're gonna pick your typical stuff, you know, you know, time zone, language, et cetera. It's localized into a number of different languages. Hard drive, again, we tried to make this pretty simple, so we're just gonna pick a disk, if we wanna use the entire thing, and then you can select your file system. So in this case, I've chosen a ZFS. And then we have an option to install our own bootloader as well. You may or may not want that if you're dual booting with Linux and already have Grub set up or something. And we can do GPT if you need large disk support. Another thing we add into PCBSD is a network management GUI. PCBSD's, or uh, FreeBSD's networking is a lot different from Linux, so we can't just bring over Network Manager or compile it and have it work. It would be a lot of rewriting. So we've written a lot of our own utilities to do things like this. And it supports you know, your typical Ethernet and Wi-Fi devices, IPv4, V6. We got some cool stuff in the background you can enable that allows you to do failover. So if you're on a laptop, you can enable the lag interface. It's just a checkbox and you can be happily working on your network, unplug, and it seamlessly transfers to the Wi-Fi without dropping your state so your downloads continue, et cetera. So there's just some neat little features we've added to it. And this is what it looks like. Again, qt -based GUI. All of our GUIs are written in QT, and it just shows you what devices are available. You can enable system tray icons if you wanna have the little status showing you what's going on, see all your IP info, et cetera. And then, of course, all the room for adding DNS, gateways, IPv6, and there's the lag interface I told you about. One checkbox, it just does it for you. Another thing we've added is a system management utility, and this allows you to do some FreeBSD-specific stuff, such as fetching the FreeBSD system sources. Why would you want to do that? Well, maybe you want to compile a port and it needs to compile a kernel module and it's gonna bug you for system sources. You don't have to go look up the command line command to do that. You can do it via the GUI. Or it does port snap, which lets you fetch the FreeBSD ports tree. You wanna compile something by hand because you wanna turn on IPv6 support in Apache, you can do that. You can fetch all your ports. And we got some features where you can generate like tech support sheets. So if something goes wrong, you send me the sheet, I can look at your hardware output and figure out, okay, you got some weird controller we, we you're having problems with or something. This is what the system manager looks like the first time you bring it up. 
And again, uh, just got some tabs up top, giving you some different options here, and then the big uh, diagnostic sheet button. This would be an example of how we download source from FreeBSD right now. It's still using uh, CVS up, although they've moved to subversion, so I'll be updating this to subversion at some point, but this is still uh, mirrored, and you can pick which part you want and just say, do a checkout. Another big thing that we do in PCBSD is our package management system is completely different. This is something pretty unique for us. But we use a system called PBIs, which is for push button installer. What's different about it is it's a self-contained package format. It keeps your operating system separate from your applications. So instead of uh, extracting a, an archive and putting files all over the place, they end up in one nice and neat little directory, self-contained contained away from the rest of the operating system and other applications. And this provides some stability to the user's desktop experience. Now you can add or move programs at will, even things with possibly conflicting library types or versions because they don't work well with the newer one or the older one or vice versa, and they just don't touch one another. So a little bit closer, because I get a lot of questions on this. Well, first of all, why we did this. My philosophy is applications are not your operating system. Your operating system is a self-contained unit. Updates to that come down a different pipeline, and that should be based off of one set of things. And then your applications are just things you run on top of that. They shouldn't be monkeying around with my KDE libraries or my GTK libraries just because I want to install a new web browser or something. So we try and keep things separate. And again, they're self-contained, so they have all the required files and libraries within, and we just don't touch system packages. We leave that alone. Now, this is just visually what I'm talking about here. This is your typical open source operating system. This could be Linux, kernel, it could be FreeBSD even, because this is what they do with their ports and packages. You'll have your kernel or your base, and then you'll start building packages on top of it. And this could be libpng, and then everything depends on that, and then GTK, and so forth and so on, until you actually get to something useful up top, like Firefox. And there can be thousands of dependencies on your typical system. And if you notice, they're very interconnected, and if you pull one of these pieces out, usually bad things happen and your weekend is ruined, right? So this is what we do in PCBSD. We have our base system, which is FreeBSD in this case, and then your desktop packages, which only depend on the base. That could be KDE, LXD, whatever. And then your PBIs are all self-contained and only depend on some of the base system stuff, like libc, just some very basic libraries that don't change between major releases. So you can run a PBI that was uh, compiled on PCBSD 8.0 all the way up to 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, and you don't have to upgrade it if you don't want to. If it's stable and it works the way you want, great. You can do that. Now, one of the things that's different in 9.0 is if you've run PCBSD in the past, we were very KDE-centric back in the day, and uh, we kept getting requests on, hey, we want to run other stuff. So the first thing we did is we made the window manager uh, utilities all system agnostic. So now you can run any window manager you want. During installation, you're given the choices of the major four, which I consider KDE, GNOME, GNOME 2 right now, XFCE, and LXDE. Although we have a ton of other unsupported window managers, like Window Maker, Fluxbox, Openbox, a lot of the lighter weight ones, the only reason we put those in the unsupported category is that they don't support the XDG specifications for desktop icons and stuff that our package manager does. So we consider that more like hardcore users. If you know how to make your own icons and shortcuts, use those. But for everyone else who just expects an icon to show up, use these four and you're good. And we had to re-implement the PBI system to do this too, so it was all uh, agnostic and could understand, okay, we're this window manager, that, and know how to work with each one. Um, big part of that was we had to remove all the KDE hooks that were in our tools and switch to pure QT4, which we've done. Um, Post-installation, this is not locked in, so after you've done installing your system, say you load up KDE4 and it's too heavy for you, you can always go into the system manager and say, let's remove that and add LXDE, log out and log into LXDE, and you're done. So you're not locked, in, locked into anything by any uh, stretch of the imagination. And again, these are the four major ones I talked about. Here's some of the unsupported ones we offer. And if you have a favorite and would like to run it on PCBSD, odds are it's been ported to FreeBSD, a good chunk of them are. I just need to get the request. Somebody shoot me an email or tell me, hey, I like this window manager, and usually we can add it within a day or two. It's not that difficult, just a couple uh, comp files. 
So this is what it looks like during installation. You're given your choice. Here's our packages. What do you want to install? And then, of course, you can fine tune it and go in and remove parts of KDE you don't want. You don't want the educational stuff or maybe the development tools. You just want to run the desktop. So you can fine tune it to some degree as well. We don't get into too much nitty gritty with this package system. It's uh, I, something I call meta packages. So that's still a collection of packages underneath, but you're not going to have to go through and figure out, oh, I need KDE PIM libs and libs and base libs and workspace and all these just to run the desktop. It'll figure out what you really want. You want just KDE, we'll figure out what those packages are for you. So we've tried to simplify it a bit. And this is after installation, exact same widget, same options. So you can always go in and add or move stuff post installation. And like hardware drivers is there. That's where your NVIDIA driver will be. So if you decide you want to run your NVIDIA binary driver, click it, it shows up. Another thing we've done is we've added an improved control panel, which again is agnostic to the particular window manager. It provides a consistent user experience, which was important, especially for documentation purposes. We want you to be able to go to one spot and regardless of the window manager you're running, have some kind of consistency so we can tell you, go here, configure this, and it'll fix your problem. And it does detect the running window manager and it shows some appropriate icons as well. So you go in there, maybe you're running LXDE and it brings up the LXDE utility for setting mouse options or keyboard options. So we do some things like that to make it convenient for you as well. And that's what this looks like on a PCBSD 9. There's actually a lot more icons in it now for 9.1. And here's where you can auto detect what window manager you're using. It'll show you the current, but you can even switch between them. So if you have GNOME installed, you can switch and see what GNOME utilities can I run here as well. So one of the things that we redid for 9.0 is we had to rewrite the PBI format completely, since it was very dependent on KDE stuff, QT, and we had to go back and uh, fix some issues with it. So we had some problems with the old one. It had a tacked on command line interface, which was all QT based, not very friendly to use at the command prompt or on a server if you don't want to load QT libs. It was wasting space because it wasn't sharing libraries. It didn't really have any distribution infrastructure. We just had a website where you downloaded and added your PBIs. No signatures and the file updates were very large. So these were some of the problems I wanted to address in uh, 9.0. So the first thing I did is I re-implemented the entire tool chain in shell for portability on FreeBSD. So we can take this tool chain, run it on FreeBSD. It's in uh, uh, PFSense now is what they're working on adding that for their plugins. FreeNAS is using it, very portable. No reason we couldn't move it to open or NetBSD even, and possibly Linux someday if somebody got adventurous and decided to port it over. Um, all the functionality is available via the command line. You don't have to have X at all for anything anymore. Another thing we wanted to do is add intelligent library sharing. We were wasting space before. So I create, came up with a system that allows sharing all the identical files you have between PBIs. If I have a PBI of Thunderbird and Firefox, they both have libgtk in it, which is identical most of the time. So we want to be able to share that. So we set up a system of sharing these files and libraries with hard links. So you only have one copy on disk and one copy in memory, even though each program thinks it has its own copy. Um, we are able to uh, reduce the disk and runtime memory usage, and we can track all the matches with checksums, so everything's now automatically checksummed, and we can tell if something's been tampered with. And so we just have a daemon that runs in the background that just keeps things up to date and says, okay, you've installed a package, let me just check and make sure we're consistent here. Wayne? Yes? The, uh, the uninstalling hmm? uh, something um, that has libraries that also are shared by others. Yes. Well, so the question was, what happens when we uninstall a PBI and it's got libraries that other PBIs maybe are using? What happens to the libraries? Well, because of the way they're hard linked, I'm going to show you here in a future slide, it keeps those libraries for the other applications and won't remove them, and the daemon takes care of that. I think that's actually the next slide. So good question. Here we go. So here's the example you're talking about. We have two PBIs for you know, Kicks, we'll just say it's Thunderbird and Firefox, and they happen to have libfoo.so.1, which is identical, the checksums match. Well, on PCBSD, we have a directory we call the hash directory, and that's where we place libraries when a program's installed. This is what the daemon manages in the background. 
it's going to take the first library and say, OK, I'm going to add this to the hasher. It doesn't exist. And it adds the file with the checksum appended to the end of it. So we can easily look at it and figure out if it's been changed or tweaked. And then on its next pass, it goes, ooh, we've just installed Firefox. It has the same library, and it exists. It removes the original, hard links it into the hasher. So again, we only have one copy on disk right now, but two programs see their own copy of the library. And the way FreeBSD loads libraries, it's looking at the inode. So they're both pointing to the same spot, so we only get one copy in memory. So we've saved both disk and memory space. Now say you come along and you upgrade Firefox, and now they have a new version of the library, or an incompatible, or something's different about it. Well, we can unlink and just create a second copy with the checksum appended to it. So we have two copies on disk, and maybe they're conflicting. They won't work together. But now each program's happy, and they just keep running. They don't care. But if we come along later, and we remove the PBI1, now we have an orphan left in the hasher. And that's kind of what you were asking here. The, the daemon will then go through and clean that up and go, OK, nothing's using this library now. We can safely throw it away. And uh, with the way hard links work is if they're both using the same library, we just remove the one instance here. And then we can check the reference count and see if anybody else is still consuming that library and clean it up if it's down to one. So pretty simple, very, very quick. Yes? Correct. The, the question, yeah, the question was, does the hasher have to exist in the same file system? That's correct. Uh, by default, we're going to put it in the slash user file system under user PBI. All your PBIs install into there, and the hasher exists there as well. One thing I'll mention about this, which is kind of neat, though, is because the PBIs don't touch the rest of your system, in 9, you can install PBIs as your user account. You don't need root for probably about 95% of all the stuff in our catalog. Firefox, you don't need a root for that. You don't need to give anybody root to install an application. They don't need to use sudo. Nothing's magically doing root in the background. It's just installing it and extracting it to a directory. And we have group permissions and stuff set up so that works. It's kind of similar to how Mac does their model, if anyone's looked at that. But yeah, it's pretty sweet. So uh, distribution, another thing we needed to add was a mechanism for creators to distribute PBI files to the end users. And we needed some way to integrate that with digital signatures. So that's been added in 9. It allows us to maintain a master index of release PBIs, along with a meta index that has additional information, like here's Firefox, here's the description, here's the license, here's the website, the author, et cetera. And then we can display that you know, via GUI or elsewhere in a meaningful way. The meta index is actually on the hard drive, so you can browse it and then issue your commands to download PBIs from the repo or perform updates of older PBIs and newer versions, all by looking at one index file. The way we do digital signatures in the PBIs is automatically done with OpenSSL, which is in the FreeBSD-based system, so we're not depending on anything outside of what's in FreeBSD. Everything from the archive to any installation, removal, scripts, anything that could potentially be dangerous is gone ahead and signed with the OpenSSL, so we make sure it's not tampered with. And then at installation time, the end user, or whatever front end you're running, will take a look at the signature and can warn you and stop you know, if it's been tampered with or possibly gotten corrupted even during transit. Another thing in the old PBI format was binary patching was large. Since a PBI contains a lot of libraries in it, they tend to be much larger than a traditional package, which just has a couple things. So I need to come up with a system to fix this. So what we've done in 9.0 is we create binary patches from old versions to new versions. So you can update via this binary pack. A good example was I had a 100 meg PBI, and the patch was like less than 2 megs to upgrade it from version to version. So very minimal. More often than not, it's only a few files that change between updates, and it just gets the binary diffs. We use the commands bsdiff and bspatch to do this. Those are built into FreeBSD, and they're pretty cool if you want to send binary patches around and fix them. Yeah? What was that? Oh, the question was, do we have support for wine? Yes, we do. We, uh, we, uh, on PCBSD, we have a couple wine packages. We have your regular 32-bit wine, which is what we build. Then we have a special one for AMD64 systems, which will link in like the NVIDIA drive and other, so you get accelerated wine goodness and can play games and all that. So, yeah. Um, we also um, have the ability to auto-generate patches from port builds. 
So when, on our server, when I get a new version of Firefox, it spits out the binary patches when it's done. So I can upload those along with the new PBI. And if you're on Firefox 10 and 11 comes out, it's going to grab that you know, couple hundred or a couple hundred kilobyte or a few megabyte patch, whatever it ends up being, and using that. And then it'll fall back to fetching the full file if BS patch fails for some reason, which may happen if you're a tanker or a hacker and start messing around there, changing files and checksums don't match anymore. So we're going to go ahead and check for that as well. So another thing we've added for 9.0 is a graphical utility we call the App Cafe. This is basically our marketplace. This is our store where you can browse for all kinds of applications. It's a Qt-based front end to the PBI browser command line utility. So again, if you've SSH'd in, you can do everything via the command line. PBI browser lets you browse categories, see what's available, uh, shows you how to install stuff. It's really cool. And then uh, in the App Cafe, you can go ahead and run it as your user account. You don't need root. And then you can add and remove applications. It'll only bug you for root if you install something that needs it. Uh, VirtualBox is a good example because it has to load kernel modules and do a few things that uh, not a normal pr uh, program would have to do. It has support for browsing and managing repositories and mirrors. So you're not locked into just our mirror. The PBI system includes support for making your own repositories and mirrors. So if you're a company or you're rolling your own project like FreeNAS, there's nothing stopping you from creating your own repository with your own keys and signing packages. And you can even import them right into our utility, and we can browse them all graphically. And then, of course, includes support for a nice KDE-ish uh, tray icon, which shows up and tells you when things are out of date and need to be updated. So this is what it looks like um, on 9.0. Just again, it's a browser with categories. Since the index file is stored on your hard drive, searching is instant. You can just type something in, and bam, it shows up. So it's really quick. You can just click on your category, your application, and it'll bring up details about it. This is what a typical one looks like. Firefox, it's installed, you know, details about versions, et cetera. We can also do automatic updating. Since we don't have to worry about it tweaking dependencies and worrying about it breaking something, you enable automatic updating, and the daemon will just keep an eye on it every 24 hours. And if the version gets bumped, it'll install it for you. And once you've got applications installed, there's ways where you can go through and view the details again. I added some support for doing uh, additional desktop icons, menu icons. Sometimes there's a case where somebody installs something and deletes the icons. They're like, oh, how do I get those back? Well, you can recreate them now. It'll just uh, put them all back where they were. We also have a utility called the Life Preserver, which is pretty unique to PCBSD. It's basically a, uh, a simple utility which will allow you to do rsync over SSH backups to uh, uh, any server running SSH and rsync or something like FreeNAS, for example. So if you have a PCBSD box, you can safely back up all your data daily, and it'll just do rsync uh, diffs. It's a tray application that'll just sit in the tray and let you uh, do your thing. You can schedule them. And again, it uses rsync over SSH, so you could be backing up to a Linux box even. It's really agnostic as long as it has those two utilities. And that's what this looks like. You bring it up. I've set up a backup to my local server here. Don't have any backups done. You can schedule it, et cetera. It's very, very easy to use. So PCBSD 9.0 came out in January of 2012. Um, at the moment, we have all kinds of installation media, including making VirtualBox and VMware images. I may be adding QEMU images for 9.1 here uh, in the future. I've had a couple requests for it. And of course, live media, and we have some light ones too. So if you want a small USB image with just LXDE, you can grab that. And of course, post installation, you can add KDE if you want it. It includes the Quick Start Guide and Handbook, which uh, Drew Levine worked a lot on getting that already. And it's a great PDF with just tons of information on PCBSD and FreeBSD. So if you're new to both, it's a great place to get your feet wet. And it has support for ZFS and the new UFS journaling, which was in FreeBSD 9.0. But what's coming for 9.1? Well, we're currently rolling snapshots for 9.1 based on FreeBSD 9 stable, which has some new features. But uh, on the PCBSD side, what we're adding right now is a greatly simplified installer GUI. It's not going to look quite like what you saw in the screenshots here. It's literally two or three screens, next, next, finish. You only click the customize button if you don't like the defaults, and even that's really simple. Um, we've added an integrated warden jail manager. That's a graphical and command line utility for PCBSD uh, desktop and server edition, where it'll allow you to create and manage jails, all within uh, one easy-to-use command. 
Um, there's a new Bluetooth utility that's uh, GUI. We've added, uh, I don't know if anybody knows what BEADM is from Solaris. That's boot environment support. So that's where if you're running ZFS on your uh, file system, you can instantly take a snapshot and then you can roll back to that and say, I want to reboot into that snapshot later if you screw something up. And then you can delete the, the new one or whatever. So it's just a great way to tinker with stuff and not worry about, am I going to destroy my OS? And we're going to be doing frequent updates of desktops and such in 9.1 as well. So when the new KDE you know, 5.0 hits or whatever, it'll come down the pipe usually a week later. So uh, that's a couple of the new features in 9.1. So I want to let you guys ask questions now. And I'll be happy to show things off if I have it on my laptop. Yeah? question was, how do we handle upgrades between versions? Well, we can do rolling upgrades. So the update manager will just notify you, hey, PCBSD 9.1 is out, and you're on 9.0, do you want to upgrade? It'll look at your desktop and figure out which desktop packages you have installed. So if you have KDE, it'll build a package list and then fetch all the new stuff from the server and the new base environment of FreeBSD. It'll reboot, apply them all, reboot, and then you're back up to your desktop. So we're going to try and do rolling updates for everything. I'm, I'm doing them right now for 9.0 to 9.1 to 9.2 to 9.3, and maybe from 9.3 to 10.0. I'm a little iffy on that just because FreeBSD may change significantly underneath the hood, so I'm not committing to that yet, but if we can, we will. So, yes? Any support for doing uh, any headless installs for, for not installing any of Sure. The question was, do we have support for doing headless installs, not installing any of the desktop stuff? Well, on the disk, you can install the PCBSD server edition, which, but still, you gotta have a head, you gotta have some kind of VGA connected to it to see the GUI. But another thing we've added to 9.1 is a new thin client server. So you're able to run a command and then pick if you're gonna be setting up a thin client desktop server or install server. And if you're doing the install server, it'll let you pixie boot clients, select the installation script you want, and it'll just go ahead and install it. So that'll make it easy for deploying system in a completely headless uh, environment. Any other questions? Okay. Question was, what kind of minimums do we need to have to run it? Well, it varies depending on your desktop selection. If you're looking at KDE, you want you know 12, 15 gigs with all the different packages and whatnot. If you do something lightweight like Fluxbox, you might be able to get away with like six. So that's hard drive space. Speed-wise, um, you can use it on a P3. I mean, I I like multi-core. If you want to use ZFS, you need to be on 64-bit with you know, two, four gigs of RAM to use all those features. But uh, RAM-wise, 512 is usually pretty good. Um, you can go below that, but I don't recommend it just because a lot of the window managers tend to be happier with more. So. Yes? Uh, yeah, the question was, do we have a web page where you can look at all the PBIs that are available? Uh, no, not yet. So what we have is uh, the index files stored on our server right now. We have somebody writing a, a fresh pbis.org kind of to correspond with fresh ports that will parse that and display it in some kind of web format. So there will be one coming soon, but it's not up at the moment. What was that? The question was, how large is the team? Uh, committers, I think, developers, probably six, six or seven developers, and then you got testers, documenters, people who pop in and out and do translations. There's a ton of translators, maybe 20 of them. So, I mean, they were a pretty small, nimble project. But, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, is there any uh, area where you're different from the Linux? You mentioned this global packages. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was, how are we different from Linux? Maybe things we have that Linux doesn't or Linux has that we don't, and a question about how the kernel works. Well, there are some things where we differ. Since uh, we're not Linux, we don't have access to all their drivers. So we tend to lag a little bit behind for some Wi-Fi drivers right now. But on the other hand, we tend to have great Ethernet drivers because of FreeBSD historically being an awesome server. So uh, that would be one area. Um, video drivers would be another one. 
Right now we have awesome NVIDIA drivers. We've done work with NVIDIA to make those really good, but the ATI and Intel driver tend to lag a bit behind. So that would be an area where we're a little different. Um, things that we have maybe that Linux doesn't would be like native ZFS in the kernel. So we can just do that right out of box. Linux, you gotta load some fuse modules and stuff to do that, and it's kinda hackish at the moment. But uh, question about the kernel, though. It is a big kernel file. Um, what specifically did you want to know about it? Well, I guess I'm interested in hearing about the kernel in Linux, which is the essence of Linux mm -hmm. as opposed to the distro. Um, the kernel is now a bit number, and it has those 10 bits. Oh, sure. How is that the evolution of the kernel in BSD? So the question was, how is the evolution of the kernel in BSD versus a Linux, where you're getting version revisions every so often? Well, it is a bit different. So the FreeBSD kernel is tightly integrated with the base environment. So when you get a FreeBSD 9.0, you get a FreeBSD 9.0 kernel, which works well with all the other user land stuff. They're very tightly integrated. So you're not gonna be seeing a separate FreeBSD kernel update come out in the middle of a 9.0 release cycle. You won't get a new kernel until 9.1 comes out. They have a head and then a stable branch where you can follow along with the development. And if you want to run a stable kernel and recompile it yourself every couple days or weeks, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. That's what our snapshots are based on. It's just a cut of FreeBSD stable during the development process leading up to 9.1 right now. But uh, you're not going to be, again, seeing a big update coming down saying FreeBSD 9.0.0.2.3, some kernel coming down on your 9.0 system. The only time you'll get an update if you're on a release is for security vulnerabilities. And then you don't touch the kernel until the new release comes out. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. So the question was, we do track FreeBSD right now. Will there be diversions in the future as bigger changes come? Hopefully not as long as I'm around. I don't want to ever fork it off and change. We, we have people who've made changes for us, and then they make changes, and we try and push them back upstream, because I don't want to have to be maintaining patches all day. I mean, that's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. But no, we want to keep, we want to put everything back into FreeBSD. We're not going out and developing proprietary modules or anything weird like that, and then saying we're not going to push it back upstream. That's not, not what we're about at all. Yes? The question was booting from ZFS and the, what did you say, zone manager? Yes, the warden thing. Oh, uh, the warden thing, okay. Well, they're completely different, different projects uh, or things, but booting from ZFS, you can do that in FreeBSD. Where they're lacking at the moment is their installer they have for the traditional FreeBSD uh, text mode installer it doesn't have ZFS support. So if you want to add ZFS or boot from it, you got to go to a shell, run the commands, build the file system, set it up yourself whereas we just kind of do it for you right out of box. Just click it and it's done. Um, the warden's separate. It's, that's just a top, it's a layer on top of the jail system already in FreeBSD. So everything I'm doing in the warden for jails, you could do from FreeBSD if you know all the command line kung fu to do it, right? But the warden just makes it easier and sets it all up for you. The warden is in PCBSD. Yes, the warden's included in PCBSD. Yeah, yeah, so, so I, occasionally we make some of our stuff into ports and put it into the FreeBSD ports tree. So the PBI format would be a good one. We actually have a port, so if you install native FreeBSD, you can add the PBI package manager right into FreeBSD and never touch our site or any of our stuff. Some other utilities like the warden, though, I've kind of pulled back from doing that, not because we don't want to make it open source or something, just because it relies on a lot of things that are all part of PCBSD and making a port, which includes all that, would be pretty difficult, you know, might as well just install PCBSD. I mean, yes. Sure. Sure. Well, so how about both? Okay, so here's the secret. So in PCBSD 9.1, what we've created is something called the PCBSD server, which again is just FreeBSD. It's pretty much vanilla FreeBSD, but we have the command line utilities for PBIs and the warden all built in. So all of our custom utilities are there. 
that you would normally have to hack into FreeBSD. And uh, you can install that with ZFS and all of our awesome install options. So that supports there, and if you have, if there's something specific you want in the FreeBSD installer, though, I can give you a lot of mailing lists where you can post all kinds of stuff about why doesn't your installer do this? Yeah. What was that? I didn't catch that. To build your own configuration for an installation? I'm not. I'm not as familiar with their software now. Mm -hmm. Config. Sure. Okay, so the question was, could, do we have a way where you could build your own custom config packages? Yeah, using a GUI. So what we have right now is we don't have a GUI which will do it, aside from our install GUI. Um, behind the scenes of our install GUI, every install is actually a scripted install. So you can do that right now. It's not, there's nothing fancy linking it together. But after each install, it saves the config we used on your hard drive. You can then take that script, because it's just a scripted install, tweak it, put whatever packages on it you want, and then you can deploy it via the Pixie server, for example, and do headless installs. So you can one time use our GUI, lay everything out just perfectly, all your ZFS data sets and options and all that goodness all in one spot, and then take that config and replicate it as many times as you like. It's not via the web, but it can be done with our tools, yes. Uh, yeah, the question was, what's our jelly utility like? Is it full disk encryption? So yeah, it can be full disk encryption. It works on what FreeBSD has called the geom layer. So that can be an entire disk. It could be just a slice or a partition. If you want to get crazy, you can put jelly and put ZFS on top of it. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can work that. But yeah, it can be full disk as well. Yes? So, uh, let me ask what Dillard just said. Hmm? Okay, so the question was, how well does sleep currently work in PCBSD? Sleep is awesome. It works so well, it'll never wake up. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, it depends on, the, depends on the hardware you're on. Like this laptop, I can suspend, resume, and it works fine, but it depends on the hardware. There are a number of issues with FreeBSD, and that would be an area where we lag behind Linux and having proper suspend, resume support. And it, yeah, it's one of those things. Depending on the hardware you got, your mileage will vary. <laughs> not an easy issue. I think the case is we have a certain ACPI standard we follow, and of course, not everybody else follows that. And the, spec, the hardware doesn't. So, we're still fighting that battle as well. Any other questions? Would you guys like me to show you anything while I have the screen up here? Um, one thing I was going to point out, for those who are curious, I didn't have a slide, slide of it, but in 9.1, I'm actually running the snapshot here. This is what the warden looks like by default, the GUI. Again, this is all uh, command line as well. But I've gone ahead and created a couple jails. I've given them a few IPs. You can give them as many as you want, plus IPv6. And uh, we have utilities with them, so we have graphical user administrators for your jails. We can launch terminals in there. We can check for updates and upgrade your jails and upgrade packages inside them for you. And we can export it to a single file that you can take and import on other hardware. So if you want to migrate systems, it's easy to move a jail from one system to another. This is kind of a cool feature. If you are running ZFS, we like ZFS. You want to use ZFS because it is awesome. So we provide support in the warden for letting you take snapshots of your jails. So if you're going to do a potentially risky Apache upgrade or own cloud or whatever it is you're running, you take an instant ZFS snapshot, and then you can delete it when you're done or roll back to it should something go wrong. And last but not least, we are starting to build up a set of packages for jails as well, which is just using the FreeBSD package commands in the background. But we'll have pre-built Apache, MySQL, uh, you know, whatever you want, we can get a package of it out of those 26,000 ports and make it jailable. And uh, we can load that in there. And then, of course, it'll warn you about keeping it up to date as well. So it just tried to take all the guesswork out of creating jails and managing them. Well, let's see here. Oh, I don't know if you can see it that well, but it's all command line based as well. 
So uh, the question was, do we have a command line warden? So all these utilities, graphical things I'm showing you, I think pretty much all of them have a full command line interface as well now. And that's something I'm insisting on so that when we build our PCBSD server edition, you get the command line version. And if you like it, there's nothing stopping you from moving jails to a desktop, tinkering with them, and then moving them back, and so forth and so on. But yeah, this can all be done via the command line. Any other questions from you guys? question was, FreeBSD, PCBSD, what bootloader do we use? Uh, FreeBSD has its own bootloader, and so we're using that right now. It's really simple. F1 to load BST, F2 to load Linux, F3 for Windows, whatever. Um, I'm not sure, is there a name for that, Drew? To the FreeBSD bootloader? <laughs> bootloader? Um, yeah, it doesn't have a fancy name like Grub or anything. It's just the bootloader. And it's the standard one that's in FreeBSD, so we piggyback off of that. The question was, what is the default file system for FreeBSD or PCBSD, I guess? Um, for FreeBSD, it's UFS right now. That's their default file system, and then you have to hack on if you want to use ZFS. PCBSD, it depends. In the snapshot, it's going to auto-detect based on your hardware. If you're on 64-bit and you have a couple gigs of RAM, it's going to push you towards ZFS because we want you to be using these features. Even if it's on a desktop or laptop, I mean, you can benefit from a boot environment or taking snapshots. Plus, you have things like compression, where we can compress a bunch of directories with uh, just text files in them. So it's going to depend on your hardware. If you're on more reasonable, modest hardware with less RAM, it's going to default you back to UFS with journaling. So you'll still have that as a fallback option. But you know, I'm a big fan of ZFS. The longer I use it, the more rabid I get about, like, you have to be on ZFS. This is the coolest thing ever. So we're going to try and push you that way if we can. Yes? The question was, where is SSD support in PCBSD? We have support for it. They've added the trim options to the UFS. Um, did they add that to ZFS yet, Drew? I remember reading about. Oh, OK. So what Drew said was there's an argument being made that the way ZFS does its thing, it doesn't need trim. Yeah, I mean, it's doing copy on write anyway. Yeah, that is correct. It's doing copy on write. So maybe that's unnecessary. But for the UFS side, they have added trim support. Mm -hmm. do you have any live CDs? Question was, do we have any live CDs? Yes, just not here. So if you go to the website, um, the ones we're handing out back there are the install disks. I don't have enough room to get both a live image and the install in all our packages on the one. But you can go to the website and grab a live media or a live USB if you'd like. They're all on there. So the question was, ZFS, does it need a 64-bit capable CPU or the 64-bit OS? Well, neither. You can install it on 32-bit. There's nothing in the installer that's going to stop you. It just gives a recommendation, AMD 64 with RAM. Uh, I don't push people that way. ZFS on 32-bit is really discouraged because it's pretty easy to kill your system with it. It's designed for the extra addressing space. So if you go and try and move over a big 2 gigabyte file, it's pretty easy to knock your system over and be done. But AMD 64, we don't see that. That's what it's designed for. So nothing's stopping you from running it, but you do so at your own risk. And when you say AMD 64, you mean CPU-wise, there's some Intel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when we say, excuse me, when I say AMD 64, I mean the whole family of 64-bit architecture. It's just what FreeBSD labels there is AMD 64 and i386. Those are our 32-bit and 64-bit so platforms. So you don't get something like, like that only in the CPU or PAE mm -hmm. uh, capable. Um, if, if you could do it, you won't have dreadful problems installing uh, it. Yeah, yeah, more RAM, definitely. I don't know about PAE. I've not, uh, I've not played with that on like a 32-bit and tried that. Drew, do you have any idea how that works? That seems really hacky to me. I, I mean, I would just run the 64-bit OS version. If I could, I have not played it, though, so I have no first-hand experience going that route. So. OK. Uh, what was the suffering for a while on 64 bit? It had a 32-bit library for some applications. Mm -hmm. uh, how is uh, uh, PCBSD on that? 
question was, how do we handle basically 64-bit OS and then running 32-bit applications and handling libraries underneath? Well, the, one of the cool things about the PBI format is being self-contained. We run 32-bit stuff on 64 all the time because they include the libraries they need. That's how we get around and have a wine package. So you install the wine package, and really it's installing uh, the 32-bit version, but it's got all the libraries it needs to run 32. So on PCBSD, that's less of an issue. Um, it's still kind of hacky if you want to do it manually via ports. You have to set up like a true environment and set up 32-bit world and build stuff in there. But just use the PBI system. We've done all that work for you. And you can just grab 32-bit packages of emulators like uh, Super Nintendo emulators, you know, whatever, and those just work on the 64-bit host because they have the libraries they need and everything's pretty kosher. Any other questions, guys? I appreciate it. These are awesome questions. I like getting good questions because that gives me ideas about what to talk about next time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We'll go back here first. The question was, he needs to compile Firefox nightlies every day. How would we do that on PCBSD? Yeah, it is a long compile process. We have some neat utilities like Tinderbox, which can help automate that, where it'll cache like all the packages, the intermediaries that maybe don't change, and just compile the Firefox code. Um, I, would, I don't see why you couldn't do that. The biggest problem you'd probably have is just if there's any custom patches we have for FreeBSD to uh, make it run on FreeBSD. That, that, that's yeah, we try, and, we try and push a lot of those upstream. So those tend to get pushed upstream as soon as we can. And then it's non-issue. You can just compile it kind of out of box. We have our own make file structure with the port system, so you can piggyback off of that and just tweak the version number or whatever and, and go to town. Um, I've not personally done it, but it can be done. I, I don't see too much difficulty with that. I'm sorry, we'll come back here. You had a question. Just, just to remind you, also, the lunch, the, the lunch ticket is fine. Oh, yes, yes. I have an extra lunch ticket, and, or drinks tickets, I think that's what these are, and a lunch ticket. OK, and if anyone wants them, come up and see me afterwards. I will be glad to hand them out to you, because he could not stay. You had a question? question was, do we have our own web browser? Well, we don't have our own custom web browser. We use the standard ones you see on other, yeah, Firefox, Chrome, Opera, Conquer, was it Epiphany and Gnome? I mean, all the standard ones are there. But uh, we're not going to, I don't foresee us writing our own. We have some cool stuff they did with Chrome on FreeBSD. At some point, we may be getting a special package version of that with Capsicum support, which is their big sandboxing security, ultra-secure environment, which encapsulates the browser. So we may be rolling out with a package of that here fairly soon as well. But uh, yeah, it's all the standard stuff. And was you had a question? The question was, do we support Dropbox? Uh, no, at the moment. They only release the Linux version. And we can run parts of it through the Linux simulation, but we're waiting for somebody to add some iPoll features to our Linux simulation, and then we'll be able to run it. Um, I get around that. I run my own own cloud instance on FreeBSD slash PCBSD. It works great, and I've been using that. But uh, that's something that'll probably come here in the near future. Yeah, yeah, we can't run Netflix. Sorry, no Silverlight. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Any other questions, guys, or should I let you go to dinner? Okay, well, I thank you guys. I appreciate you coming out. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source.
the, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. 
this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.